All right, let's get started. Um, so you all owe me a present today. Um, uh, so that's collected up there. Homework number six, sheer design. Um, real quick, um, we were looking at the example last time, and we were looking at the shear diagram, and there were some values that didn't quite look right on the plot. I went ahead and replotted it, and my plot looks a little different than the one that's in the slide, so I put that here. But in the end, the story is the same, that ultimately, here's your shear diagram, and that the, uh, the, the factored resistance is, or uh, the factored strength is always a little bit higher. So, so there's that. Um, so a couple things in terms of housekeeping before I get back into shear. I just wanted to mention that. But first off, um, did y'all receive emails from me? Either was it yes or it was, it was it, no, it was the day before. It was Monday about senior design. So if you are already in senior design, you didn't hear from me. So what I, what I did is I had done an analysis of senior design. So. Uh, basically, if you're still on the old curriculum, there are six tracking courses, and to get into senior design, you have to have uh, completed or are concurrently taking four of them. And if you're on the new curriculum, uh, there's uh, breadth classes and design classes, and you either had to have four breadth and one design or three breadth and two design completed by the time you enter senior design. So everybody that's eligible should have gotten an email from me that said something to the tune of, okay, here's the deal. If you pass everything you're in now, you're good, or if you pass everything you're in now, and as long as you take like one other class next semester, you're good. You should have gotten an email like that from me. Okay? Now, just so you are aware, the way senior design works, we manually enroll you into 452. So don't like say, well, I can't, you're not letting me sign in. It's not going to let you sign in. The only thing I'll say is just make sure that you're scheduling around it. Like, don't go, well, I, you wouldn't let me in senior design, so I went ahead and took something else Wednesday at 4 o'clock. Like, no, don't do that. So what, what's going to happen, th this is how it's going to work. So we're going to populate a list of students, and we're going to enroll you into senior design. And if you don't want to take it, you can just drop it. You know, I, are you sure you want to take senior design? You're like, well, I don't want to take it, but... Um, but another thing that we're going to do is we're going to do an analysis at the end of May once the semester's over. You have to pass what you're in now. So if for some reason there's an issue there, uh, we'll let you know. Sound good? Okay. Um, so all right. So there's that. Um, oh, one other thing. Uh, homework six. Homework six is the shear design homework. There's three problems. But I'd say that of all of the problem, of all the homework assignments that we've had up until now, this is the one where the problems maybe are a little bit tricky. Um, and so what I mean by that is there's three problems. The first problem is really easy. It's really easy. The second two are, they, they require some finesse is what I'm going to say. And that'll become clear after today because we're going to talk about how to design for shear. Um, we talked about how to analyze for shear last time, and I think that's really easy. You know, you have VVC, VVS, add them up, there you go. Um, and so today we're going to talk about design. And so with that, I'm going to stop the, you know, the diatribe and just get right into it. So, all right, so let's talk about design. So first off, when it comes to design, let me back up a little bit. So what, what we have here on this slide is a shear reinforcement layout, okay? So we, the way that shear design works is you typically assume, okay, we're going to use n something like, oh, I don't know, number three stirrups that are U-shaped, and so we know the AB, we know the FY, we know the area. What we're designing is the pattern, okay? And so the pattern is, okay, we have so many stirrups spaced at four inches, and so many stirrups spaced at eight inches, and so many stirrups spaced at ten inches, and so on and so forth. And so shear design, it's all about laying that out, determining that pattern, okay? So before we get into this, let me say a couple things about that, okay? Now, what we're doing in here is reinforced concrete design that is primarily geared towards building systems. So in building systems, you know, you're talking about beams that are getting repeated hundreds of times throughout a, a building. How many floor beams do you think are in this building? A lot, right? So usually what you're wanting to do is to try and keep the design somewhat simple and then just repeat it over and over and over and over and over again. Whereas in bridges, it's a whole lot different. You know, a bridge might have four beams and that's it. So there's really something to be said about really 
fine tuning and tailoring your uh, shear stirrup layout to, to meet the load demand because you can really be a little you know, nitpicky, if you will, when you have a system that just has smaller elements. So I guess what I'm saying is we're going to keep it simple, but I think you'll see throughout this process how if you wanted, you could really get, uh, 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 get down to the nitty gritty, and, and you'll see what I mean. So first off, let, let's go to basics. Okay, um, let's just go, go at this from a math perspective. So first off, how do you compute the capacity according to shear? Well, the capacity according to shear, uh, VVN, is VVC plus VVS, right? You just add up the, the shear capacity provided by the concrete plus the shear capacity provided by the steel. Now, what we're trying to do when we, when we do this is we're trying to determine this. We're trying to lay this out. So really what we're trying to solve for is S. We're trying to solve for the stirrup spacing. Well, we have VVC plus VVS. What is VS? Well, VS is AV times FY times D over S. So all you have to do is take this equation, rearrange it a bit, and there you go. We're solving for S. It's, it's, uh, the, the math here is pretty simple. Okay? Now, using it and using it correctly, to be honest, is going to, going to take a little bit of attention. But let me point you to a, a, a couple of things that you kind of need to be aware of. So first off, okay, and there's actually a lot more on this slide than it seems. So there, there's actually a lot going on. Okay. So, um, there's a lot more going on here. Uh, so let me, let me break this down slowly. Okay, so first off, ACI says that you have to provide stirrups everywhere that the shear is larger than half of VVC. Now, you might just go, okay, okay. Well, let, let's think about that for a second, okay? So anywhere that the shear is larger than half of VVC, well, that might not seem to make a lot of sense if you really sort of think about it because um, there, there's a region, well, what if the shear, uh, what if the shear capacity is just VVC? Um, you know, what if we have a really low shear and the concrete by itself has enough strength? Do we really need stirrups in those regions where the concrete has enough strength? Uh, actually, yeah. Um, what the code says is, I don't really care what's going on. There might be regions where the concrete is strong enough by itself, but you still have to provide some measure of stirrups, okay? Uh, and that'll, be, that'll become clear when we do our example, but, but the reason why is because Remember, when concrete elements fail in shear, they fail quick. So what the code is saying is, I don't really care what's going on in some of these regions. You still have to provide some degree of reinforcement to prevent that sudden failure. And that'll, that'll become clear here. Now, if you have really, really small shears where the shear is less than half of EVC, you don't need to worry about it. But you'll, you'll, we'll see that here in a second. Now, um, I have here a bullet that says, in most cases, uh, we can begin the shear design at a distance D away from the support. What that means is this. I have an image here of a beam, let's say it's simply supported, and I've got a load on top of it. In most cases, what I can do is I can actually compute the shear at a distance D away from the support, and I actually use this shear right here to, um, uh, to begin my design. The, the reason why is because right there near the support, you can have a lot of concentrated force effects. The idea is, is, is in reality, it takes a little bit of time for those, or and a little bit of distance for those stresses from the support reaction to be propagated throughout the beam and for it to actually behave like a beam as opposed to just getting squished on by this massive reaction force right here. And so that, that idea is called a concentrated force effect. Like, for instance, in steel design, we won't really talk about it uh, in very significant detail, but when you have, let's say you have a beam, right, and you have a 50 kip load right in the middle. Well, you have to ensure that that beam has adequate bending capacity, you have to ensure it has adequate shear capacity, you have to ensure that uh, it, it uh, doesn't deflect too much, but you also have to ensure that the beam just doesn't squish. I mean, you're putting 50,000 pounds right at one point. The beam itself might just want to go and just fail right there. That's what's called a concentrated force effect. So, um, so what the code allows us to do is actually back off that shear a little bit uh, and, and handle that appropriately. Now, there, there's a couple of cases where you can't go D away from the support. 
One of them is when you have the load applied directly to the tension flange, although admittedly that's kind of rare. Um, what is not very rare is what's called a corbel. Uh, if you just go into any parking garage, you'll see these sort of all over the place. Basically, you'll have uh, the columns that are supporting the beams and the way that we cast them, we cast them with this sort of little nub on the outside and then the beams sit on top of them and those little nubs that stick out are called corbels. We can't do a shear reduction when we're designing the reinforcement for this. We have to actually use the shear uh, as is. But for our purposes, we're going to be able to uh, use the shear D away from the support. And that's called a reduction because if you look at your shear diagram, right, here's your shear diagram. This is the shear at the support, but the shear D away from the support is somewhere like right there. So it's a little bit lower than what you get there. So we're allowed to do that. Uh, that, uh, uh, what's called an end shear reduction because the shear is lower. Okay. Um, <coughs> now, um, that equation that I first showed you where we solved for S, we're solving for S, we're essentially solving for what is the required stirrup spacing at a given point on the shear diagram. However, um, we are limited by an, an S maximum. Okay. So what I mean by that is you know you, you might have a beam design problem where you solve for the required stirrup spacing and let's say you solve and based on the loads on the beam it says you need a stirrup spacing of eight inches but then for some reason you solve for s max and s max is six inches what that means is is that you know you only need eight inches for the load but the code is saying you can only go to six inches so you would just use six inch spacing everywhere and there you go that, that, that would be a really easy design Usually that doesn't happen, and so what ends up happening is you have a range of uh, stirrup spacings that you're using between what's required and what is uh, S maximum. Now there are, there are actually two different S maximum limits that we're going to employ. One of them is actually based off of the maximum stirrup spacing. The other is based on the minimum shear reinforcement requirement. There was a limit that I showed you earlier in the presentation where the code is saying you must provide at least that much reinforcement. So we have a limit on spacing and a limit on the amount of reinforcement. But the way that we use that for design, we just take this equation and rearrange it and solve for an S max. So it's a little bit tedious, but it's, it's, this part's actually pretty easy. So let me explain how the, the procedure works. The first part, and this is the part that is Clearly the most labor intensive is we have to construct the shear diagram for the beam. And by construct the shear diagram, I don't mean go up and then, you know, little to a lot or something like that. I mean, there's actually some construction that's involved. You have to actually plot some points and, and do some analysis of the, uh, uh, of the structure and find some very critical locations uh, in order to uh, 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 construct a usable uh, diagram for design. Now, once you have that diagram, um, you can then start your design. Now, now let me be clear, there's going to be three regions uh, of the shear diagram uh, that we're going to want to indicate. First off, and I'm actually going to start at the bottom. So first off, this region here. Anytime that the shear force is less than half of VVC. Remember, VVC, that's how much strength we get out of the concrete by itself. Well, anytime that the shear load is less than half of that, we don't have to put stirrups in that region at all. So, this is going to be a region where we don't place stirrups. Okay? Um, Any time that the shear is larger than VVC is obviously where, where we're going to need some reinforcement. The concrete by itself is not strong enough to, uh, uh, is not strong enough to provide uh, reinforcement, or, or it's not strong enough to provide adequate strength, so we have to provide some reinforcement. So what about section two? Section two is in between. So theoretically, to give you kind of an idea, uh, um, section two is saying, okay, the concrete on its own can resist the forces, but the code is saying we have to put reinforcement there anyways. So to give you kind of an idea, what, what stirrup spacing do you think you would use in this region? To see if everybody's paying attention. The concrete by itself is strong enough, but we still have to put stirrups there. So what would you use? The max, right? This is going to be the region where you're wanting to ensure that you're using the maximum stirrup spacing. There's no reason to use S equals 4 inches 
if the S max is 12. Use S max is 12 here because you just don't need the reinforcement for strength purposes. In this region, you should be using S max. Now, the way that we go about design, we don't technically point that out, but it sort of happens by osmosis anyways, and, and you'll, you'll see that. Okay, so we're gonna construct the shear diagram, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna calculate uh, the required S to begin your design. So we're gonna begin our design, and you'll see when we first start going through this, we're actually gonna have a few different designs that we produce, and you're gonna see as we produce these designs, they get better and better and better. And so you'll see how that, how that works. So what we do is we compute a shear, a shear D away from the support, that end shear reduction. And so my name for that in the notes is VU star. So if you see me use this VU star, VU star is the shear, the shear right here. So here's a shear diagram, and VU star is the shear right there. So we're going to compute the shear D away from the support, and then at that location determine, okay, what would be the S required. Then we'll say, okay, we're going to try and improve that design by throwing in S max. So we determine what S max is. This step's kind of boring. I mean, it's not hard, but, but it's boring. So we'll determine S max, and then step four, this is where things get a little nuanced. We, we determine where can we start using S max, and that goes back to, to using our shear diagram. Um, we lay out our stirrups, and then you'll see here uh, step six where we can uh, improve uh, that design by including additional increments of stirrup spacing. Now, as a final step, and I sort of glossed over this a little bit, let me go back. We have two different S maxes that we're going to compute. Um, we have S max one and S max two. Now, S max one assumes that the, the strength uh, provided by the steel is less than four BWD squared of FC prime. That is pretty much going to be the case for just about every uh, design that we produce. But step seven is really more of a formality to make sure that we don't violate that, that we're not producing a design uh, that doesn't meet the spec. Don't worry. Uh, these, these steps actually might seem a little bit much right now, but we, we take it pretty slowly. Any questions so far? Okay, let's look at a design problem. Now, I just want you to be aware, this beam has got some shear on it. This is, this, I mean, look at these numbers. That beam is seeing 11 and a half thousand pounds per foot. That, that's a lot. That's a lot of load. Okay, now, let's, uh, let, let, let's break this down. So I have a beam that's 16 inches wide, it's 25 inches tall. So remember, the shape of the beam is primarily determined from your moment design that we did earlier, you know, homework three, homework four, all of that. Uh, the shape of your beam is determined from that, and what we're trying to do is determine the shear uh, uh, stirrup layout. So the beam is 16 inches wide, 25 inches tall. We got four KSI normal weight concrete, 60 KSI steel. And as for the beam itself, it's 20 feet long, and it has 11 and a half kips per foot. So let's be clear, that's a lot of load, okay? And what we're going to try and do is lay out a shear reinforcement pattern to resist this load. So with that, let's just sort of, let's just sort of jump right into it. Okay. Okay, now, <coughs> let's just write down some of these beam properties so we have them. Should I call them system parameters? I'll call them beam parameters. It's too easy. FC prime is 4 KSI. Now, I said this was normal weight concrete. What does that mean? Lambda is 1. We have FYT is uh, 60 KSI. We have um, B is 16 inches. We have D is 25 inches. And we have um, W sub U. Now, now, keep in mind, one of the things with this problem is that you were given a factored load. I could have given you a dead load and a live load and told you to factor it. 
I don't think that that's too terribly difficult. And this is L is 20 feet. Now, one other thing for this problem is we're going to assume number three U-shaped stirrups. Now, what does that mean the, from what we did last time? Like, w what parameter does that help us compute? The area, particularly A sub V. And so what would A sub V be? Well, let's just go back to basics. How many bars? Two times the area of a number three, right? And so two times what? Anybody remember what the area of a number three is? No, 0.11. Now, hold on, we're going we're to pop quiz. Let's say you didn't remember that. How do you determine the area of a number three? No, 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 no. You don't have, you don't have any, any guides. All you have is a calculator. The diameter is three over eight, right? Remember, it's a number three. How do you, what's the diameter of a number three? It's three over eight inches, so three eighths. So pi over four, three eighths inches squared, right? And so, everybody okay with that? Remember, anything up to a number eight? You divide the, take the, the number, divide it by 8, and that's the diameter. And so this is 0 0.22 square inches. Everybody okay with that? All right. Now, let's construct the shear diagram. Now, here's the thing. I'm sure some of you are like, well, well, here's the thing, Dr. Mike. Um, we've got these nifty little beam analysis aids, you know, online, and it's been a while since I've taken 312 structural analysis. I'm just going to be perfectly honest with you. If you just roll up your sleeves and do this the hard way, there is, the, there is a smaller chance for you to make mistakes. If you try and use those pre-canned formulas, I'm not saying they don't work, they work, but through experience I have found that students who try and take the shortcut by using those pre-derived formulas usually end up making mistakes. Okay? So just roll up your sleeves, do it the hard way, and you'll probably end up uh, uh, resulting in fewer mistakes. What do I mean by that? Okay. I have a beam that is seeing WU is 11.5 kips per foot. What I am ultimately after is a reaction here and a reaction here, okay? All right, now that beam is 20 feet long. So what can I do with that distributed load? And how much is that load gonna be? Say it again. Why'd you get that? The collapse load in the center. It's 230. And this is 10 feet. I mean, is everybody with me on this? Okay. And so what are the reactions going to be? Is everybody, like, do I need to go through that? I mean, tell me, because it's only going to get harder, because the, the next examples get more, uh, get trickier. All right? Now, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to determine, ultimately, an equation for shear. So, secret weapon of structural engineering, samurai sword, or lightsaber if you're a sci-fi fan. So, here's my beam.
All right, help me out. This is x. So tell me what to do. All right, getting out of it. This is CE312 that I know everybody knows how to do because I'm the one who taught you how to do it. Tell me, tell me what to do. Okay, so what is the magnitude of that point load? Now, we don't necessarily need this distance, but that's going to be x over 2, right? All right. So which way does the shear go? Down. There we go. And so this is V. We're going to call this VU of X. And then there's a moment. So here, let me, let me, let me redo this. So, so there's VU of X. And then there's MU of X, right? Everybody with me on that? So I can sum forces in the Y direction. And I get, or sorry, forces. Y'all were just letting me do that. So I have 115 going up. And going down, I have 115x. Am I missing anything? VU, which side? Down. We'll, we'll just put that as VU. Or you can put VU of x. It doesn't matter. I have 115 kips equals, now, y'all are letting me go along with these mistakes. It's 11.5. 11.5x plus VU. So therefore, VU is 115 minus 1.5x. Is everybody okay with that? All right, tell me. All right, now I'm gonna I'm gonna do something else. Um, if you notice here, I made a kind of a rookie mistake, and by rookie mistake, I did not write the units. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and rewrite that with the units because I'm, I'm making a point. And you'll see why. This is 115 kips minus 11.5 what? What are the units for the 11.5? Kips per foot times x. That's going to become relevant here in a second. Because I'll point you to a very, very common rookie mistake. Okay. Now, is everybody with me on this? Another thing that I'm going to go ahead and do, and it's not going to be immediately relevant right now, is I'm going to rearrange this equation, and I'm going to solve for x. So how would I rearrange this equation and solve for x? Well, what would I do? VU minus 115, right? And then divide. So that could be VU minus 115 over this negative, or I could rewrite that as 115 minus VU over 11.5. Did everybody see what I did there? So subtract that over, and then divide, but I'm dividing by a negative. So what I could do is just flip the direction of that subtraction and say it's positive. I just didn't want to deal with the negative on the bottom. Okay. That might not seem very useful, but it, it entirely is. And so let me explain. This is the equation that we use to determine shear values on the shear diagram as a function of x. So if I want to know what the shear is, here's the beam, and I want to know what the shear is right here, I plug it into the red equation over there on the right. And so that's what the, the shear equation tells us. But this equation says, okay, if I have a value of shear, 
where does that value occur on the shear diagram? That's what this equation tells us. And we're going to use both very, very soon. Okay? Now, we're not quite done because we got a couple things we got to figure out. Now, in order to construct this shear diagram, we need a few values. One of those values relates to the concrete capacity. So somebody remind me, how do I compute VC? This is, remember, this is the strength provided by the concrete. And it shouldn't be that, that uh, crazy that we're computing this because we're trying to determine how much reinforcement we need. Well, as a baseline, we probably need to know how much strength is provided by the concrete. So it, doesn't, it shouldn't be that surprising that we're computing this. Anybody got a, got a formula? What? what? That, there we go. Did you, what did you say? 25F? What was that? Oh, okay. But yeah, that's right. Is everybody following with me? Okay. So plug and chug, tell me what's right. Two times what? Times somebody else. Come on. I got one person answering questions. There we go. Times what? No. He's looking at me. Uh, yeah, you're a funny guy. He's like, 4 KSI. And he's like, <laughs> you're a funny guy. 4,000 PSI. So what does that come out to be? I, I've, I've gone straight into cheesy mode, haven't I? What? No, 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 units. No. Pounds. We have PSI times inches times inches. The units are pounds. So what, uh, so since our shear diagram, a, a lot of things are, like we look up here to the red and the blue equation, I see a bunch of kips everywhere. So let's, uh, let's convert this into a consistent unit system and let's say it's 50.596 kips. So if I have that, what's VVC? So, well, what's, what's V? There we go. Remember, for shear, V is always 0 0.75. And that equals what? Have a second on that? Okay, now, one other value that we're going to go ahead and compute is half of VVC, okay? Because remember, we don't have to provide stirrups anywhere that the shear is less than that. So we need that value. So half of 37.95 kips, and that's what? 18.97. Okay. So far so good? Now, I could probably plot the shear diagram right now because, I mean, think, what is the shear diagram going to look like from a 30,000 foot view? I'm going to go up, you know, 115. I'm going to go down something like that to minus 115 and I'm going to go up, right? That's what the shear diagram looks like. I think we all know that. But what I'm trying to do is plot some very detailed values, you know, on this diagram. So what this plot is going to look like is I'm going to look at this side of the plot. I'm going to zoom in. I'm going to blow it up. And I'm going to try and indicate some very key values. What am I trying to indicate? Well, there's three values I'm really interested in, okay? The first value that I'm interested in is VU star. Okay, VU star is the shear at x equals d, right? Now remind me, what's our equation for shear? Like somebody tell me. No, 
Yeah, yeah, the equation, yeah. So what is it? 115 minus 11.5x, right? So I'll tell you what, why don't we do this? Why don't we take 115 minus 11.5, and what's D? 25, right? You're shaking your head no. Why are you shaking your head no? So what? Exactly right. Units. Pay attention to your units. This is wrong, okay? This, so let me rewrite this in a less sloppy fashion. This is 11 point, or 115 kips minus 11.5 kips per foot, and D is 25 inches. So I need to multiply that by 1 over 12. Okay, so this is what I mean by saying don't be sloppy, write it out, take your pencil, write the little f, write the little t, cross the t, write the kip, dot the i, I mean write it out. You will make less mistakes that way, I promise. Okay, so what is this shear value, what does it come out to be? 91.04 in, or not inches, that's kips. Do I have a second on that? Okay. All right. So that's the shear D away from the support. By, by the way, can somebody tell me on the shear diagram what is this distance right here? 10 foot or 120 inches. Everybody agree with that? Okay. Now. So we've got, so, so we now know what the shear is D away from the support, okay? I'm going to compute a couple more things. I'm going to compute X, sorry. I'm going to compute X at VVC. So what do I mean by that? What is VVC again? 37.95. So look at my shear diagram. This is 115, and so 37.95 is going to be... I don't know, about like right there, I want to know what the x value is on the axis. Okay, and so how do I do that? I say, I use this blue equation up here, and I say 115 kips minus the shear, and in the shear's place, I'm going to put 37.95 divided by 11.5 kips per foot. Does everybody see what I'm doing? So what does this come out to be? Excuse me. Say it again. 6.7 feet. Exactly right. So what is that in inches? All right. One more. We're going to compute the X at half of VVC. So it's the same uh, calculation, only instead of 37.95, we're going to do 18.97. So 8.35 what? which equals 100.2 inches. Okay, I'm going to give everybody a sec to write this out because i got a big drawing coming up. All right, everybody good? Okay. This drawing is going to be kind of big, so and so give me a little bit of latitude. So, and and I'd hold off for drawing it out until you see what I did. So everybody, just watch up here for a sec, okay? So, what I've got is a plot that looks something like this. 
Now on the x-axis, I'm going to have x in inches, and on the y-axis, I'm going to have shear in kips. Okay, so my units are kips and inches. Now, we said that the shear diagram looks something like that, right? Okay, so let's identify some key values. Okay, this, okay, what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to say that that is the reaction, right? Because isn't that how this works? The shear diagram, the first value is the reaction, and that's 115 kips, right? Okay. Now, what is the x value here? No, no, in inches. Okay. So, just right on the face of it, is everybody okay with this? Now, according to ACI, we do not have to use this shear value of 115 kips for design. What we do is we back it off, okay? And instead, we use the shear value at a distance D away from the support. What is D? 25 inches. So what we can do is we can go, let's say right here, where X equals D, which is 25 inches, and we can instead use that shear value. So in actuality, what our shear diagram really looks like is this, and this is just like the theoretical shear diagram. That's actually our shear diagram. It's a flat region up here, and then it goes down. Now what's the shear at that plateau? That 91.04, so this is VU star, and that's 91.04 kips. Everybody okay with that? Now there's two other values that we need to indicate, VVC and half of VVC. Now VVC was what, 38 point something? 37.95, so that's gonna be somewhere about right here so this is VVC 37.95, and half of VVC is going to be about like that, 18.97, right? And so what I'm interested in is where does that occur? Well, where is this point right here? Say it again. And this point right here Everybody with me? This is what I mean when I say construct the shear diagram. I'm go ahead. This, well, this is what I was talking about where we're dealing with concentrated force effects. Right there at the support where you see that massive 115 kips, it's not really behaving like a shear on the beam. It's more so behaving like a concentrated force right there at the support. I'm not saying you don't provide reinforcement for that concentrated force effect, but not as a shear effect on the beam. Does that make sense? Everybody else okay with that? Yes. That's a great question. Why are we doing it in inches instead of feet? The answer is our stirrup spacing increments are in inches. We use S is 4 inches, S is 8 inches, S is you know, 10 inches. So keeping this in inches makes it easier from that standpoint. Now, what we have ultimately identified, however, is three regions. Okay? So this is where VVC is, right? This, or actually, let me, let me redo that. 
This is PVC. This is half of PVC. And what is this line right there? That's the center line of the beam, right? So here's what I propose. What we have done is we have split this into three beams, or three regions. Now this region over here on the right, this is everywhere where the shear is less than that, right? Everywhere over here is where the shear is less than that. What can you tell me about that region? We don't need stirrups. So, we, so no stirrups required No stirrups are required right here. Here, stirrups are required. So what can we say about this region in the middle? We should be using S-Max. What do you think? All right, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you some time to copy that down, and then we're going to call it, because next time we're going to finish this up. Shear takes a while to explain, so I'm taking my time with it. I don't want this to go like that. I'd rather take my time with it and make sure you all understand it. But is everybody with me so far? That the actual shear diagram for design starts here, flat, and then goes down. while you're copying this down, another thing to be, that, that's very, very critical when you're performing these types of calculations, um, that you're always comparing apples to apples. If you look at the y-axis, what do you see? You see VVC, factored shear, VU, factored loads. You're always going to be using factored values, whether it's a VVN or a 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live. You know, you got to make sure that you're comparing apples to apples. <coughs> this shear diagram and the construction of this shear diagram becomes more critical, um, or, or not want to say becomes more critical, but this is an easy problem. Problems with point loads and other load effects you got to pay attention to what you're doing, so. Is everybody good? All right, I'll give you a sec. That's a great question. The stair step comes from the resistance, the strength. We don't know what that is because we haven't designed it yet. You see what I mean? 
like how, how would you determine where the steps start and begin? You don't have a reinforcement pattern. You don't know that there's 12 stirrups spaced at four inches and six stirrups spaced at eight inches because that's the whole point of this example is to determine that, to actually design the pattern. So that we will finish on Friday. So. Is everybody good? All right, I'm going to stop the recording and I'll leave this up here for a little bit in case you're uh, continuing to work on this and we'll finish this up on Friday.